sé que tenía un chico sucio, sudoroso no sé. y macho. Y yeah. eso le dije a su chico, claro, esta sí. mañana Daniel se despertó y me dijo, Samantha, ve mi chico de sudor. Y solo pensé, eso es tan sexy. Aunque está aquí, pero nos conectamos, tengo mis reservas. Y Daniel es muy What's up, Juan? Good. How are you? I like I like your white coat. <laughs> yeah. Hey, is that Nevin? Yep. Hey, Nevin. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. Right, look at the stage, looks awesome. <laughs> you happy with it, Evan? Yes. Good. One one slide I'm annoyed with, but we're gonna let it we're gonna let it go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hmm. I'm trying to see if I can guess. I'll let you know later. Okay. <laughs> uh, Hello. <laughs> James. Hi, hey. James. What's up, guys? <laughs> All right. It's, oh, it's so beautiful here. All right. Yeah, right. How you doing? How you doing, Dr. Steinmetz? Great. How are you? Long time no um, see. Yeah, I know. It's been a minute. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. What's up, James? New faces here. How you doing, Mo? All right. So Nevin, um, I'm, I'm gonna yeah. pretty much I'm gonna introduce you. And I'm gonna kind of read off your bio as a as like a formal intro. Okay. And then, um, Mo, if you wanna, like, as people roll in, if you wanna kind of corral the audience, kind of guide them as we get started. Yeah, sure. I like that everyone's spawning right up there, so it makes so It'll much more like, sense. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm going to exit just for a second, fix my boundaries, and come right back. Sure. It's important to set boundaries in life. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. Lesson of the thing day. we all need to work on. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely. Nevin, what do my hands look like right now? Um, They look like they are going backwards to your arms. <laughs> like you are very, very EDS double jointed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. Now your elbows are pointing forward and your hands are <laughs> not sure what they're doing. There you go. Okay, I'm back. That's that's a bit more optimal. Oh, all right. <laughs> hey, I just saw that our friend Kaiden joined. How you doing, man? Hey, how's it going? Yeah. Good, good, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, see how this all works. This looks great. Yeah, yeah of course, man. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> so for those of you who have joined, if, if any of you are using your laptops or your computer isolating the not the arrow keys necessarily but the um q w e so the the w key makes you walk forward uh q makes you kind of turn left e makes you turn right um so any combination of those three you'll kind of walk in a directional manner um i think a and d will let you strafe left and right uh, and s will make you walk backwards and if you want to just teleport somewhere, you'll take your mouse and click where you want to go. And for those of you who are on your cell phones, 
uh, it's really just kind of you pan left and right to to direct your your gaze basically, and then tap where you want to go. Nevin, I didn't know you were a swimmer. Well, uh, I was all growing up and then tended not to be because I dove, but <laughs> I swam the 50 <laughs> because I was good at that. As soon as I did a flip turn, things went downhill quickly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So yeah, my senior year, my... I did zero workouts swimming. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? <laughs> but I swam, yeah. But I swam the fifty and the relay. Um, oh, nice! Quite, su what was quite your, successfully. What was? <laughs> we were, were you a sprinter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very we nice. won state. Nice. Our, our our relay won state, and we won state. Our team did. So. Really? It's pretty cool. Wow. That's, yeah. That's a big I mean, deal. remember James? I grew up in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Not Florida. <laughs> Thanks. That's great. I, I remember in Florida, like making it to, to districts was a big deal. Never mind states, you know. There's, there's a few more people in Florida than there are in Wyoming. <laughs> Fair enough. Few. All right. So it's. It's 7 o'clock now, so for those of you who are here, welcome to the Invirtuo stage. I'm very glad that you all could be here. Um, in just a moment, I'll give some introductions. I'll introduce Dr. Steinmetz. I just, just want to give a little bit more time for people to start rolling in, get oriented to their controls. Um, again, if you just logged in and you're on your computer, and Q, W, and E keys to navigate around as opposed to the arrow keys. Um, and if you're on the Oculus, it's, you know, you kind of point with your hand and, and use the, uh, the joystick to kind of toggle to where you want to go. We should get some music in here next time. Oh, yeah. I was just thinking that, you know what, I wonder if we can add music. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I will be sure to write the developers, because that is a good idea. Yeah, I wonder if you and like... And the fish. Don't forget the fish. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are we getting... Are we bringing fish in? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no now that, that we have seaweed, I think <laughs> oh, yeah. this obviously makes sense. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> well, you know what? This is. Uh, let me just do this another time. <laughs> <laughs> Right. We'll give it about uh, we'll give it about three more minutes and we'll get started. Yeah, I think that's good. All right. I'm gonna kind of direct these people. Hey everyone. How are you guys? My name is uh, Mo, Dr. Omar. Um, so we're likely going to be starting off the presentation at the very bottom there. So everyone spawns in up here. So if you guys can um, try to see if you can work your way down there with where Dr. Gaddis is waving his arms over there. <laughs> See if you can figure it out, whether you're on your laptop or your phone or if you have the headset on. 
<laughs> there we go. Oh, we got one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Follow me. <laughs> nice work, Dustin. <laughs> Nice. And now she's levitating. How is that? One? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, welcome back to uh, yeah. <laughs> welcome back to Earth. Oh, she's gone. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was just me. Was no. Me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. See if I can get... Hello, everyone. Ray, Nicola, Erol. David, if you guys, once you figure out your controls, try and, you know, gaze your or focus your attention to the center of the stage and make your way down to the front of the stage. Down this way. Kaiden, I, I like the Ready Player Me shirt. That's very cool. Very appropriate. Thanks. It was the, uh, the default one. I didn't have time to change clothes, so I ran. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go ahead and, and get started. So first of all, I just want to thank everyone for coming. And I want to, uh, you know, welcome Ooh. Dr. Steinmetz, who has agreed to take time out of her busy, insanely busy schedule to come join us on this very different and unique platform to come talk about some of her, her more recent work. Um, as you can see, this is in virtuo. What we are trying to do is we are a virtual medical lectureship, medical training platform um, and every week at Thursday at 7 p.m. we have a special guest just like Dr. Steinmetz who uh, you know specializes in any any sort of medical field really uh, to come on stage and and you know teach us something new um, so real quick here Dr. Steinmetz uh, she's originally from Wyoming as we were talking about earlier where she grew up competing in swimming diving basketball and track and she focused on academics specifically science and math courses after high school, uh, she went on to earn her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Texas Tech University and her master's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Education, specifically in the science and technology STEM, basically, has on mentoring aspiring young female scientists and engineers. Upon completion of her master's, she worked as an outreach uh, education scientist in underserved areas in Den uh, Denver Metro Schools. After unfortunately experiencing a life-changing uh, vehicle, excuse me, motorcycle accident where she sustained a traumatic brain injury and several musculoskeletal injuries that involved several years of rehabilitation, she decided to return to the University of Colorado at Boulder and pursued her PhD in chemical and biological engineering, investigating tissue engineering strategies for engineering the osteochondral interface between bone and cartilage using human mesochymal stem cells. Upon graduation, she received the Whitaker International Postdoctoral Fellowship Award and completed her fellowship research at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, Nevin then joined the team at Regenix in 2015, and she currently serves as the Chief Scientific Officer, where she leads a team of clinical and lab-based scientists and engineers who conduct groundbreaking research to advance the field of interventional orthobiologics. So without further ado, Dr. S Dr. Steinmetz, if you could... Uh, Take us on this journey. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gaddis, for that introduction, and um, as Dr. Omar as well, for having me on the stage today. Um, I'm happy to join you all. So if we could make our way up to the left um, from where I'm standing now to where it says osteoarthritis on the slide. Basically, today we're going to be making our way around the stage in kind of an interactive fashion. Um, to experience the talk that I've presented today. So it looks like most of you guys have kind of figured out the navigation strategy. Um, and we've set the slides up in such a way that hopefully, depending on where you're standing, you'll be able to see kind of if you're on the lower level or up here kind of close. Um, so <clears throat> today we're going to talk mostly about things to do with the knee. But we're going to get started, just some basics of osteoarthritis. So I'm not sure what everyone's background is, but I decided to tailor this starting with some of the basics. And so I just want to go into a little bit about arthritis in general 
and specifically osteoarthritis, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is the most common form of arthritis, and a lot of people suffer from this disease. In fact, 32.5 million Americans, uh, U.S. adults, which is about 25% of adults over the age of 30, suffer from this disease. Um, and about 62% of those people are women. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this disease is defined primarily by people suffering from joint pain, and often this joint pain is very severe. It's not just joint pain, though, that um, affects patients. It also can lead to depression. Um, it can affect their sleep, and the, the pain often leads to disability and um, activity loss and work limitations. So then if we can move our, our attention to the second slide, we're going to talk a little bit about the type, the most common type of osteoarthritis, which is knee osteoarthritis. And so oftentimes we talk about how do people get this disease, and actually the primary cause is wear and tear with age. And there are things that we can do to prevent some of that, and that's keeping a healthy weight on and being active and having um, a healthy diet. But just over time, you know, we see common knee arthritis in elderly patients. But then there are also secondary causes of this disease. And often as people right. are active in their young age, they have injuries and often needs surgery. This is very common in young female athletes. Specific players get ACL injuries often in their teens and 20s. And then we often see the early onset arthritis in these patients. Um, the secondary causes are congenital, malformation joints, rheumatoid or mis um, the symptoms, we've already talked about pain, but patients often feel stiffness in their joint, uh, swelling that is, you know, associated with that st stiffness, and often worse over time. Currently, currently there are no disease modifying, um, there are none currently available that are approved by the FDA. There are many in, in um, pipelines that are trying to be approved. Um, but none as of yet. And right now, more than 50% of suffering EOA will move on to have a knee replacement at some point in their lifetime. So many of you may or may not know that a lot of who come down this stage often are, are working in the field of orthobiologics. We'll talk a little bit about that more um, as I get further into my slides. Um, but orthobiologics are indicated in many of these cases. And the hope is that we can begin to intervene for a lot of these patients to help them avoid these surgeries when that's actually indicated for them. So now we're going to move down to the next set of slides that are kind of corralled in this little hemisphere. Um, and look at some of healthy joints versus disease joints. And so one of the things that is really cool about this platform and this stage is that we have 3D models that are available to us. And, and uh, Dr. Gaddis, I think, is much, much more professional. He's going to help us. These. And these are models that at the end of the talk, you all will be able to look at and kind of interact with. Um, for now... Um, if you guys want to try and join kind of around me here at these four slides here with the MRI images, um, we'll begin to talk about, about these uh, healthy and disease joints. So over here on the left, where we have the healthy and disease knee joint via imaging slide, you can kind of start to see in a cartoon image what is kind of going on in these knees. And so on the left, we have basically what depicts a healthy knee. And so you have articular cartilage on the articulating surfaces. And this is very delicate cartilage. We have a lot of different types of cartilage in our, in our bodies. Um, but the cartilage on the end of the articulating surfaces 
is I kind of call it fragile cartilage. It's not very thick. Um, and if we damage it, it's very, we can't really replace it. Um, a lot of my, my work for my PhD thesis was in trying to figure out how to get that to regenerate. Um, and it, it's not an easy task. It's very different than meniscus cartilage that you can see below that. And that's kind of cushioning cartilage. Um, and you can also see here depicting a normal joint space. Whereas to the right, we see bone spurs, loss of that articular cartilage, and then what we call joint space narrowing. On the right of those cartoon images, we see an x-ray and we see um, a healthy joint where you have, um, on the right, we see a diseased uh, knee joint. So you start to lose that space and we start to see a brim to the right in this little hemisphere are all going to be MRI images. And the reason that I included these in the talk today is that a lot of times when we are using orthobiologics to treat these patients, a lot more information is available on these MRIs for us to figure out uh, features that are characteristic of NeoA than would be in just a, uh, an x-ray. So from an x-ray, you can tell someone does have NeoA MRI read here. But the reason that I've included these is to just kind of show you some of the different characteristics, such as an osteophyte, which is just a bone spur, which see bone marrow edema, which is basically bru bruising in the bone. This can be either in the femur, the tibia, sometimes even in the kneecap, the patella. Um, and then on the third one, the axial view, we can see where we start to get some of the partial thickness of the chondral loss. Again, additional osteophytes, which are the bone spurs, and then additional bone marrow edema. So all of these features that are char characteristic of NeoA can contribute to the disease. And there's different ways um, to, to treat these different features to help these patients um, with this disease. And so there's no real good way to completely reverse the disease, but there are a lot of different ways to try and kind of halt the spiral of the disease and the progression of the disease. So in the little yellow box on this third MRI image, I've really highlighted is one of the things that we can never actually see on imaging, though, is the composition of the fluid that's in the joint. So we can often see if the joint is effused or swollen, but we can never see what's in that fluid. And so that's something that we really specialize on in our lab and that we've spent a lot of time on. And so that's what we kind of talk about as being the microfluid, or sorry, the microenvironment and of the synovial fluid. And so now I'd like to move on to the next two slides. And so we'll just keep advancing around here on the the stage and start to talk a little bit about what's going on in that synovial fluid. And so to continue on with the theme of the difference between a disease joint and a healthy joint, basically what's going on in our healthy joint is that we have something called homeostasis. So anabolism, which means to build up, Oftentimes, people get these confused and can't remember how to keep them straight. If you think of anabolic steroids, they're making people huge, right? They're building them up. So that's what anabolism is. Catabolism breaks down. So those are going to be our catabolic factors. So when those two are in balance, we have homeostasis and a healthy joint. But And oftentimes, catabolic factors get a bad rap because they're breaking down. But in this healthy joint and homeostasis, Stasis, we have things that what happens in the disease joint is they become out of balance. And oftentimes these catabolic factors take over, they get upregulated, and that's when things start to go, go wrong. So oftentimes we'll hear about biomarkers. And really we're just talking about all of these different proteins, um, whether they're cytokines or other types of proteins in the synovial fluid or in the body in general. And so then it's all of these types of proteins in the uh, synovial fluid for the sake of this talk, but anabolic factors and catabolic factors. I've just listed some examples here. So anabolic factors are going to be things like TIMPs, TIMP1 and 2, BMP 
seven, TGF beta, FGF, OP1 comp. Um, whereas catabolic factors are going to be MMP, TNF alpha, IL1 beta, adamant, um, IL8. And these are just a few examples. There's many more. Um, some of the really bad catabolic might be TNF alpha and IL1 beta. I kind of think of IL1 beta as the godfather of bad than our joints. It does a lot, lot to, um, can do a lot of damage. Um, whereas the MMPs are kind of, kind of the henchmen, dirty work for the matrix metallor is of a snow are impossible for breaking down. And so they break down cartilage and other cellular matrix are responsible for turnover. And so if we think about that in homeostasis, things are turning over in our bodies all the time. And so they say they get or bad, we have to do the turnover. It's just when they're doing too much of it that it becomes bad. Whereas over here, pimps, so there's of MMPs. So in homeostasis, these things are in balance. But like I said, in an uh, unbalanced disease joint, they get out of balance. So now let's talk about fluid. So like I mentioned, these biomarkers, uh, as well, many others, are in synovial fluid. But what is the synovial fluid really doing in our joints? So it's in all of our joints, not just the knee joint. Um, so what is it? So it's, it's a fluid formed um, as an ultrafiltrate of plasma actually um, across the synovial membrane. Um, and then synovia sites in that synovial membrane actually secrete a couple of other molecules that contrib contribute to it, uh, hyaluronic acid and lubricin. And these molecules are really what set synovial fluid apart from a lot of other fluids in our body. And this unique composition is really what gives it a lot of its really cool properties. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. So one thing I do want to point out, though, is that synovial fluid has more than 700 proteins, which when I first started learning about synovial fluid, that was crazy to me. That's, that's so many proteins, right? So when we, when we start to look at these that I've been working on that I'm going to talk to you guys about in a few minutes, that like just was mind-blowing because we started looking at 30 which is a very small percentage of 700. <laughs> so what, what, is, um, what is it important for? And why is an oil fluid so important in our body and in our joints? So first of all, it lubricates our joints. Remember before when I was talking about the articular cartilage surfaces and how delicate that articular cartilage is? Well, synovial fluid is, it lubricates that articular cartilage and it really helps to take care of it. Um, it, off, it also pro, uh, provides nutrition and cellular waste transport because there's cells in the cartilage, right, that need nutrition and the ability to have the waste um, transported away. And then it also drives metaboli metabolism of that, those cartilage cells and other connective tissues within the joint. Um, so I've mentioned before the hyaluronic acid and the lubricin, and, and these molecules are important, especially the hyaluronic acid. So the hyaluronic acid is a glyc glycomin glycoaminoglycan, and really what it does is it helps create um, a shock absorber um, feature to the synovial fluid such that it works basically like hydraulic fluid when it's healthy. So up here, I kind of have listed healthy versus disease, disease synovial fluid. And the thing I think that is the most important in this list is that when you have healthy synovial fluid, you have very viscous and stringy synovial fluid. In fact, one of the tests that they do when they're testing synovial fluid is literally called a string test. Um, it's not very scientific. You literally take a syringe and you hold it up and you start letting the synovial fluid out and you measure how long the string forms before it breaks. And then if it's diseased, it literally flows like water. It's not viscous and it's drippy. 
And so the viscosity of the synovial fluid is really what allows it to act like a shock absorber. So you can imagine if you were to jump off of something, I don't know, two feet high, three feet high, 10 feet high, the reason that your joint doesn't get damaged or doesn't hurt very much when you do that is because of the synovial fluid and the very amazing and unique fluid dynamic properties that it has absorbing that that fall or that jump and the um, the forces that are being absorbed. Um, and that could be a whole nother talk, just talking about synovial fluid and the amazing fluid dynamic properties, which we're not going to do tonight. So now let's move on and start talking about what are some of the different orthobiologic treatments that are available for these disease joints. So we'll move over to the next little hemisphere of slides, and we'll talk kind of about the current paradigm of orthobiologic treatments. So orthobiologic treatments are a pretty new, uh, it's a new kind of treatment space, and it's, it's just a young field. So it's growing. It's an amazing time to be part of it. Um, I think Dr. Omar and Dr. Gaddis have very exciting careers ahead of them to be in this space. Um, but for a patient, really what happens is they either have an injury or they reach a symptom threshold um, where they then go consult a physician. And ideally, in a perfect world, they would consult with a p physician initially who could present with them with or biologic therapies. But usually they don't. They, you know, maybe go to physical therapy, maybe take some NSAIDs, maybe get a simple injection. And then often the surgery, and that's a, a typical uh, treatment paradigm. Our hope is that we can intervene at some point during that uh, physical therapy, NSAID, simple injection before they get to the surgery and offer them an orthobiologic therapy at that time. And so for those of you who are not familiar familiar with or what orthobiologic therapies are. Um, if we look at the what can we inject slide, what orthobiologic therapies are very basically, because there's other things I want to get to, are that we have a variety of things that are disposable at our disposal to be able to inject as therapies for these patients. So these things can either be, they either come typically, they're autologous, so from you back into you. They can come from blood, they can come from bone marrow, they can come from fat, um, and they can be concentrated platelets, which would come from blood. Um, growth factors or cytokine-enriched serums or lysates would also come from blood. Um, on the right, the bone marrow or stem cells, those come from, uh, so it would be a concentrated bone marrow, and the stem cells, which can come from either the bone marrow or from the micronized adipose tissue. On the bottom, I've also included extracellular matrix and including amnio products. Um, I have in included some asterisks here because as of May 31st, 2021, those are now illegal per the FDA. So people should not be injecting those unless they are under an IND with the FDA. So I'm not going to go into any more detail about what those orthobiologists, I think they've been covered on this stage a few times. I'm happy to answer any questions after the talk about those, if you have them. Um, I would like to move on to talk about where we inject these, because I think the physicians that I work with, um, compared to some other physicians who do these types of injections, go into much more detail on the injection um, structures that they inject. And I think this is kind of where, where the space is headed. So oftentimes a simple injection will be performed for a patient who has osteoarthritis of the knee. And by simple injection, I simply mean one of these injectates of choice um, is placed into the interarticular space um, and call it good. Um, but the ability to do very complex injections that, that I am describing over the side which there's a huge plethora of structures to inject listed down here. I won't go through all of them, but basically you could have impacted ligaments, which may be lax. You could have bones that when I went through the MRIs, I mentioned that you could have bone marrow edema. 
Um, you may need to go interosseously in to treat those bones. You could have impacted tendons. A variety of these different structures could be impacted for these patients who it's all contributing to their disease state. And physicians do have the ability to treat all of these different structures. And so that's what I mean by complex injections, injections that treat all of these different impacted structures. And so simply just pointing out there are different types of injections that take place um, for these different patients. Um, okay, so you might be asking at this point, especially if this is not a space that you spend a lot of time in, how do we know that specifically these bone marrow concentrate therapies or any of these, uh, these orthobiologic therapies work to treat NEOA? And I have just listed here one specific um, study that has come out of our group um, that demonstrates that this has worked in a randomized control study. And this particular study we published a few years ago, it's a crossover design study where we compared treatment, a treatment group to exercise therapy for 48 patients. The treatment was a bone marrow concentrate. So autologous bone marrow was extracted from patients, concentrated down, and then re-injected via this complex injection um, treatment method back into the patient's knee. Um, it followed a three-day treatment protocol where patients were treated with prolotherapy, which I really won't go into too much, but basically it's a super concentrated sugar solution. A couple of days later, they received the bone marrow concentrate um, therapy with uh, the concentrated platelets, which are the ones on the left of this green kind of diagram. Um, and then and they come back a couple of days later and get what we call a post-treatment, where it's also those blood-based platelet products. And so for the outcomes, the top left of the outcomes is basically the patient's pain. And these are, it's very small, so it may be hard to see, but basically it's over two years, the outcomes. So you can see that the patient's pain does go down. And the other three are different subsets of function surveys. And these are all surveys that patients filled out. And you can see them up over time and stayed high over the two years. What I would like to point out, however, and you can see that they're statistically significant. What I would like to point out, however, is that there is a large, large amount of variability. And so not every patient does get better. And so this is something that, you know, keeps me up at night as a scientist is trying to figure out, you know, why are not all of these patients getting better? And what can we do to try and look into that a little bit more? And so now if we can move on to the next single slide that's a little bit bigger and has a lot of text, I will apologize for that. Um, but basically, I want to describe a study that we've been doing for quite a while now. Um, and basically, this is a study, and we, what we really wanted to do was start to look at that microenvironment that I described earlier of the synovial fluid. And so a lot of times when physicians see these patients, they're looking at macroscopic things. They're either looking at the imaging, which we looked at before, or they're, looking, they're doing tests on these patients, looking at their gait, or seeing, you know, doing a Lachman's to see if the knee joint is moving. Um, and so then you can kind of do phenotypes of patients based on those macroscopic designations. But what we wanted to look at was, are there phenotypes of patients on the microscopic level um, based on their synovial fluid? And so we really wanted to know if we could learn more about this disease state um, through analyzing their synovial fluid and this microenvironment and understand these, see if we could understand phenotypes of the patients who respond well, but also the patients who don't. And then the ultimate goal of this study for us was can we develop a predictive model to figure out if a priori, if a patient would be a good candidate for this bone marrow concentrate treatment. So none of these therapies currently are covered by insurance. And so patients are paying out of pocket for these therapies. And so our, our ultimate goal was to say, can we design a test 
that would allow a patient with some reasonable amount of certainty to know whether or not it would be a good candidate. And then they can use that information however they would like, but then they would have half an idea to know with their biology and the uh, microenvironment of their knee, do they think that they would be a good candidate? So basically what we did was we collected the synovial fluid from knees of about 450 patients with NEOA who enrolled in this study over about a five-year period. So these were patients who were getting treatment in our clinic um, who were probably going to have the synovial fluid removed from their knee anyway because it was effused and swollen. And it was going to be thrown away anyway, so it just, instead of going to the trash, came down to our lab. And these patients received the bone marrow concentrate treatment, which I just described. It was the same as what in the study that was published. We followed these patients with a patient registry. We collected their demographics, their baseline data, and then we followed up with them for outcome data at six months, where we looked at their pain. We looked at their percent reported improvement. So the patient's telling us what percentage do they think they got better or worse and then some functional surveys um, to tell us, you know, functionally, are, there be are they better or not? So as I mentioned earlier around this stage, there, there are 700 proteins in, in the synovial fluid, more than. And initially, we started to look at 30 of these proteins, so a small percentage. And down on the bottom left here, you can see this is, these little dots represent a protein each. This is a... Uh, um, an ELISA um, that you can run, and it's multiplexed, so you get more than one piece of information at a time. But again, only a few pieces of information if we're really talking about 700 proteins in the synovial fluid. So when we first started this, we looked at 30, and then we later realized we really need to be looking at more. So we outsourced the protein panels to, and started looking at 440 proteins and did this for 250 samples. But as you can imagine, if any of you have ever done very much data analysis, 440 times 250 becomes a very big data set very quickly, especially when you're trying to figure out what pro protein or proteins are proteins of interest for a model that we to create, to create a test that is literally something where synovial fluid is sent in and analyzed, and then we report back results to these patients. So this has been a very large work in progress over the last seven years. Um, we've added a variety of different machine learning models and algorithms to figure out how to determine the appropriate modeling. We, and then we employed a, a variety of different techniques to figure out which of these proteins are actually proteins of interest that correlate to the outcomes for us to use in this model. So now that we're done reading a lot of words, we can move down to our final three slides and look at some of the results of our modeling and testing. So if you would all like to join me down on the last three slide group, ultimately, we were able to take those 440 proteins and we identified five proteins of interest. Um, unfortunately, I can't share those with you. It's a proprietary model. But five of the 440 proteins are now input parameters for our model, as well as we use the patient's age and their BMI, their height and weight, um, as well as their baseline pain level. Um, we considered other baseline input parameters, but these are the ones, so a fairly simple input model. Um, and then the output, so this was interesting. We had originally started with, we just wanted whether or not these patients would be responders or non-responders. And then what we decided was actually maybe we could tell patients what type of responder they would be. And so we came up with this idea that we would have basically super responders and then patients that had a good response, but maybe not as good as the A group responders. So an A group responder is a patient who at six months had at least 50% improvement um, or better 
and a 50% or better reduction in pain. Whereas a B group responder is someone who had either a 50% improvement or better or a 50% reduction in pain. So they may still have pain, but they feel like they're more functional um, or they don't think that they are 50% improved, but they are, have a substantial reduction in pain versus a non-responder, someone who had neither a 50% improvement nor a 50% reduction in pain. And so the last slide here with data is that for the A group responders, the model is very predictable. It's 93% predict, it has 93 prediction capability for six months to tell us whether or not this patient is gonna have a good outcome. Um, it has good sensitivity and specificity and a very good area under this curve. So some of you may be familiar with these types of curves and many more of us are now that we've gone through COVID and we've looked and maybe seen some of these types of curves for the COVID test. But basically a rock AUC means area under the curve and it's the space under the blue above the red. And so you want something, if you're at 0.5, it's basically like flipping a coin. So you want something much higher than that. And anything between 0.6, and 0.8 for biology is pretty good. Um, for the B group responders, it's not as predictable, but still pretty good. And as you can see, the ROC for the A or the AUC for the rock curve is still 0.67 or higher. It's not as sensitive or specific, um, but we feel pretty good with this curve. So with this seven-year project and a lot of patients um, contributing, we feel like we've had a pretty good success with this project so far, and now we're in the process of working with a company to help us develop the test so that we can get all this to patients. Um, so in summary, um, as I mentioned previously, the field of orthobiologics is very young. It's growing rapidly, and there's many opportunities, both clinically and in research. Um, and as medicine in general grows as a field, or as grows and develops, I think more and more medicine is going to become personalized. And orthobiologics as a field of medicine is going to have to keep up with and continue to make advances. And some of the ways that we can do that is using a priori injectate information. And what I mean by that is characterizing these injectates that we didn't spend a lot of time talking about today, but some of you may be familiar with. So that means for those bone marrow concentrates, we need to know how many cells, the viability of those cells. For the PRPs, which stands for platelet-rich plasma, we need to know how many platelets are in there. So we can begin to start to talk about dosing. Because at the infancy of this field, we basically just started making these products and injecting them. We know that they're safe. And at that point, it was more just like, okay, create it and inject it. And then patients were getting better but now we have the opportunity to start to customize it and say, if a patient is of a certain age, maybe they need a higher concentration or different, um, different joints or different ligaments need different concentrations. And so that, that is an opportunity for us to um, build and tailor this for different individuals and their respective biologies and needs. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you all for joining for this talk today. And if anyone has any questions, I will be more than happy to answer any questions. That's amazing, uh, Dr. Simons. So, you know, I, I think this is, you know, a step in the right direction for something that I experience in clinic almost every day. And that, that is this discrepancy between, you know, what the patient is feeling and what their, you know, what are our current objective measures, which is the physical exam and, and imaging. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've been using those two tools for years now. With imaging, you know, I have to tell the patients frequently, listen, what you see on imaging isn't always going to correlate with what, what you experience in your daily life. I see patients that you know, have a horrible looking MRI and I see them walking up and down like no problem and right. vice versa. I, you know, people right. come in with horrible pain and disability and their imaging looks fairly benign. Um, right. And then you have the physical exam where 
you know, people don't really talk about the sensitivity and specificity levels of exams. Um, right. You know, yeah. how you how you perform and, are, you know, are you doing it the right way? There's all these different techniques. So there's yeah. this kind of gap. And yep. I think this micro environment is is the gap that we're we're overlooking. So this is really incredible. I do have one question. It is. And, and I can. Yeah. Um, based off of these factors. So I know that we were able to predict with some reasonable specificity and sensitivity whether or not they will respond, be a you know group A, group B, or non-responder. Mm -hmm. um, can you tailor a treatment or different types of treatment based off of these markers? So I think part of what um, maybe some next steps are in the thinking is especially for someone who maybe comes back as a non-responder, would be to say, okay, it's not that you're just you're not a good candidate, but rather is there something we can do to intervene in that space to change what your microenvironment looks like so that we can get you onto the path of being a responder? Can we change what your microenvironment looks like to make it look more like a responder microenvironment before you receive the treatment? Because the Microenvironment space is absolutely dynamic and it changes very, very quickly. So for some, so we actually took samples from the synovial fluid or of the synovial fluid from these patients before they receive treatment and after they receive treatment. And for a few of these patients, I analyzed the, um, the proteins before and after. And in that short period, it, I mean, it responds very, very quickly to the bone marrow concentrate that you're bringing in. And it, it's, that's a very inflammatory process, as you know. And in that very short period of time, a bunch of factors get upregulated very, very quickly. And so there's, you know, a, definitely a possibility to do something to change that microenvironment to make it much more conducive to receiving the treatment. It's just a matter of how long would it stay in that more conducive state and what is, you know, because... How I kind of envision the joint space is that you have, and I kind of alluded to it, this downward spiral that you're trying to arrest when we're not able to really reverse a, a, a knee micro or a knee environment with the osteoarthritis right now. A lot of the damage that gets done, it's not we can't do magic, right? We can't grow back a bunch of cartilage, um, <laughs> even though like I tried to during my PhD, um, but that's not where we are currently in, in science um, and engineering. But so, you know, I think we, we have to start to understand how long can we affect, a, make a positive effect in the space to be able to change that microenvironment and how can we change like the synovia sites? Because honestly, that's, you know, a lot of, the upregulation of the IL-1 beta, the TNF-alpha, the MMPs. So going back to that slide with the teeter-totters, can we try to create a more homeostasis-like space and how long can we get the joints to be in that state? Um, it's mm. kind of where, you know, the thinking is. Um, okay. And the, Yeah, so. So that, I have kind of my one more question. On that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's, I didn't really think about that. That makes sense. It's like, okay, it's not that you want to, uh, you know, you know, change up the treatment. It's not that you want to change the treatment. Yeah. 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 Um, my next question is, you know, earlier on when we were talking about the basics, we alluded to, you know, primary forms of osteoarthritis and then secondary forms like your inflammatory arthritis and so on. Mm -hmm. Did you by chance notice or did you guys have synovial fluid from people with inflammatory arthritis like like rheumatoid and, and ankylosing spondylitis and things like this? So those that was a, an exclusion factor for this study. Mm -hmm. um, but we have collected some one offs. Um, from just kind of interesting patients, like sometimes the doctors would bring, so I have a patient who one of our physicians brought me shoulder, hip, and then they were in the knee study and he knew he, that they were in the knee study and then brought me from the same patient. 
and just out of a curiosity, right? And they have a similar grades of OA in all three of those joints. And so I ran, you know, those little dot ELISAs for all three of them and was blown away by how different the profiles of those different biomarked patients with similar grades of OA of their synovial fluids in those three different joints. <laughs> And it, I mean, That's it's just, really it's mind blowing to me, right? <laughs> like how, how different the synovial fluids are. It's the same patient. And so, and like orders of magnitude different in some of those biomarkers. And granted wow. it's an N of one, but you know, I, I'm fairly certain probably no one else has even thought to look at that in a patient with multiple yeah. OAs, um, you know. You know, so, that makes me wonder if, if there are day-to-day -day factors um, that would also affect the microenvironment in the same joint. Let's say you do analysis in the morning versus analysis in the afternoon versus analysis after a carbohydrate-rich lunch versus well, I after, suspect, let's say, like... I, I would, a, yeah, I would suspect, so, like, nightshades are known to be hyper-inflammatory, right? Like eggplant and tomatoes and whatever. So if you're having a very nice like Italian meal with a glass of red wine, you're probably causing a lot of inflammation <laughs> systemically. Um, I mean, that's probably going to affect all of your joints similarly. But I honestly, I think the difference in the synovial fluids in throughout the joints, the different joints, has more to do with the fact that different joints respond to the different orthobiologic therapies much differently. So knees respond much better than hips do. As well, we see a knee, so someone might come in with a KL grade two knee and it'll simmer at a KL grade two without advancing to a KL grade three for maybe a couple of years or a few years. Or you might get away with like 10 years of having a KL grade two or three knee, you know, whereas if someone comes in with a KL grade two hip, they're probably going to be at a three or a four within two to three years. Like hip OA advances very, very quickly, and it doesn't respond to bone marrow concentrate therapies nearly as effectively. And so, you know, there's a plethora of science that could be done <laughs> to try and understand why within, you know, and I mean, there's a lot of things you could easily think of, like the, the hip rotates in so many more uh axes and the space is actually very small and you know a variety of different things um but hmm. yeah so interesting yeah but that that's a little terrifying because i i have some some hip issues myself so I, well that that, <laughs> that, 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 is a that, that bike car accident that you mentioned at the beginning when you were introducing me i uh took the side view mirror of the car to my hip and I've had hip surgery and pretty messed up my hip. So I, oh, I kind goodness. of have hip paranoia, hip away paranoia. Yeah. <laughs> That's a real thing. Uh, it yeah. is, it is. Uh -huh. So um, does anyone besides Dr. Gaddis have any questions? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not I, that I his questions question. aren't, you, aren't amazing. They're great questions. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Omar here, Dr. Simon, yes. thank you so much for that uh, amazing presentation and of thanks course. for your dedication to the sciences. I mean, this is uh, tremendous work. Must have thank taken a, a whole lot of blood, sweat and tears to oh, accomplish no, this. You know, none at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you mentioned before, you know, the research in this space is, is still in its infancy. Um, yes. As, as a pain physician, you know, I'm I'm eager and, and obviously ha having to be very patient um, before before we can be very confident in 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 how to um, you know objectively and confidently apply these therapies. Uh, so mm -hmm. far in the space, you know, a lot of the a lot of the studies are in okay, like what doesn't work or what kind of works or we yep. think this works, or we're pretty sure this works. Um, this type of research is fascinating in the sense that, um, you know, we're 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 providing predictors at patient selection, which is everything for us as physicians, right? Yeah, picking the right patients and making sure we're treating the right thing and doing no harm. Um, in your opinion, where where do you see um, the need for? Uh, 
study focus moving forward in order to sort of achieve our end goals with orthobiologic therapies and doing it appropriately? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think actually a, a lot of that can be answered with, um, because of the, the nature of the therapies we're doing and how they're, we'll say, not really regulated by the FDA, a mm. lot of studies can actually be done and just in clinical practice. So you guys are all brilliant, right? And so if you are thinking outside the box and have some ideas about how to maybe change things a little bit, as long as you are tracking your patients, if you are open and honest with your patients, small things can be done without needing IRB approval. So if you're doing something a little bit crazy, you need IRB approval and you need to run a study, right? right, right. And for that, it, you know, it may be, so like for this study, because it, we weren't changing the treatment protocol at, at all, the patient, they were fee paying patients and we just collected their synovial fluid. Some of the studies that we do, we offer free or discounted treatment if we're trying to investigate something new for patients. And they're, you know, sometimes they're very small case study style, N of 10, and then we're tracking all those patient outcomes. And if they're getting free or discounted treatment, the patients realize they have, you know, the onus is on them to make sure they're giving us those follow-up data points so that we can actually learn more about this. And so that's something that we do do because another aspect of what we do in our lab is to, to within the ability that we can with the FDA kind of guidelines of the, you know, you can spin it, you can freeze it, you can add uh, crystalloid, you know, all right. of that. We do develop new therapies. And so we test those with patients, but there's a lot that can be done just with combining things together that are already at your disposal. And if like, I don't know when I can't fall asleep at night, well, that doesn't happen very often, but when I'm <laughs> awake in the middle of the night, you know, I have ideas. And when you guys have ideas, you can start to think about those and talk to your colleagues. And if you're practicing in different places, you can start to even put together almost like multi-site studies of if you do two or three patients and you guys have talked and you're doing things in the same way, then you could gain a lot of insight about new and different ways. Because like you said, and I've talked about, this is really in its infancy still. And now that we're moving into the era of, okay, we'll start characterizing things and really learning more about dosing. I mean, I think that's really the next level is really needing to start talking about dosing. And I mean, it's been working fairly well so far where it's just kind of like, well, dose what you got, <laughs> have a syringe, have right. some orthobiologic <laughs> and treat a patient. And a lot of people get a lot better, but I think we have the ability to even take it even further and really start to help those patients that aren't having great outcomes. Um, but a lot of that I think too has to do with patient expectations and, you know, some Sometimes patients have expectations for like miraculous outcomes that are not possible, even if they're a great candidate and they receive the absolute most amazing treatment. Like some patients think, oh, I can barely walk and I'm going to be able to run a marathon after this. And it's like, that is not a valuable <laughs> expectation, you know? And so, um, you know, I probably went off topic there for no, your actual question, um, but so, so yeah. No, thank you, Dr. Summit. Thank you so stuff. much. Ooh. I don't know if you guys heard that, but there's a thunderstorm outside my window. Yeah. Right Mine too. too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's just everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know we're, we're cutting it up on, on, we're coming up on time, but I did have, have just are. one question, one last question, and that is, uh, um, you know, in the pain management world, there's like this dichotomy of conventional pain management, and then you have orthobiologics. And, mm -hmm. you know, people who have been in pain management, or at least don't know too much about orthobiologics, there's a lot of naysayers. And you approach them, and there are, you know, reflex answers, oh, there's, there's no data, which obviously there's data. Right. Um, you know, whenever we think of how do we get orthobiologics to be widely available to everyone, one on like a you know an insurance payer you know basis uh -huh. like the 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 proverbial answer is like oh we just need more 
data. We need more research. Well, or clinical you know, trials. There is plenty of research. Or yeah, what is in your experience? What has been the biggest impasse to getting these large scale clinical trials? They and, are and very, very expensive. Like what? They are. Well, I mean, it depends on. So if you're talking, so the clinical trials that we run. We don't have to run the majority of them. We choose to run them so that we can have evidence to publish papers so that we can then have evidence both for the naysayers but also for the patients, mm. right? So that we're not just saying, oh, believe us, it works. So we can then point to published outcomes, right? Peer review published outcomes to say, okay, look, we have this published for spine, for knee, for, you know, knee OA, knee, ACL, rotator cuff, a variety of different um, treatment locations, but it takes a lot of time. Um, as you're going to learn in six months, James, it takes a lot of work and, um, and bandwidth for a lot of people to be able to, to do all of that. And so someone has to pay that bill. And for us, we have been very lucky that that has been through private just someone has decided that it's very important, but small practices, and Mo, I think this is kind of probably part of the underlying question you were asking is right. like, how, how do you do that? How do you get someone on board with paying for it, um, coordinating it? I mean, I have a full-time clinical research director, right, who manages all right. of this, manages all of our studies, and interacts with them and coordinates all of this through an I, all the IRB interactions. Um, it's, it's a lot of work. And I think at the end of the day, if you aren't at an academic institution, that's probably the reason that a lot of studies don't happen. Mm. Um, and then at an academic institution, you often don't have the number of patients coming through the door as you would at a private practice who's solely focused on orthobiologics. So it's kind of like a catch-22 yeah, yeah. of the, you know, the private practices don't have enough funding and the academic institutions don't have enough patients. And often, you know, sometimes they collaborate and then that's great. Um, and so the, those are the mm. papers you do see out are the collaborative um, groups. Yeah. And so, but it, it honestly takes time. Like we have two RCTs looking at ACL and rotator cuff that took us nine years to enroll 50 patients. Wow. 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 Right? Because they have very <laughs> wow. exclusive inclusion exclusion criteria. Right. Yeah. Right. Hmm. So slow and steady, I guess. Wins the race. Yep. <laughs> Indeed. Guess, well, so. we've definitely come for much longer than this. Absolutely, so I think the the pace is is definitely picking yeah, up. Yeah, it's not it's not just linear like anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Steinmetz, well, thank you so much. Absolutely, we've, we've come up on we're a little bit, you know. Uh, and to everyone that's still here, again, thank you so much for coming. I know yeah, that it is definitely Yeah, thank you all for joining. Unique. And um, you know, tune in. Every Thursday at 7 p.m., we will have lectures similar to this. Um, follow us on social media at Invertuo, and uh, we'll see you guys later. Feel free to stick around stage and, and go over the material and play with the models and so on. Yeah. Also, guys, uh, feel free to uh, leave us some feedback, reach out to us on social media or, or via email. We'd love to hear um, how your experience went, and any, any feedback is always welcome. Thanks, guys. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Mm -hmm. Take care. James. Yeah. Uh, come up by Nevin here. Let's take a quick selfie. Oh, yes. Yeah, selfie. Yeah. Actually, why don't we... Here, come next to me. Okay. Actually, let me go up a little bit. Let's go above Nevin and then we'll have her up right here. <laughs> where, where is Nevin? There she is. <laughs> there we go. All right. One, two, smile. There you go. <laughs> <laughs>
There it is. <laughs> Boom. Nice. I love it. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. That's fun. We're gonna, yeah, we'll share that. <laughs> James, you and Mateus have the same suit, just different colors. Yeah, I know. I got the inspiration from him. He looks so oh, sharp you? all the time. I know. You both he look actually wears sharp. that suit in real life, too. Does he? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna send this. Send to me. Yeah, you want to take one more? Hey, who's your tailor? Yeah, huh? go get Juan in the selfie. Yeah, Juan, get in, in, here. in his super, in his super sharp suit or a uh, lab coat. There you go. Wait, where's James? James, get James in sneak here. in here. Come, come, come to the other side of me. Hey. All right. Oh. There we go. Oh. Now James is. <laughs> Do we get it? Yeah, we got it. <laughs> We're gonna... Oh, it's oh no, but I see oh, what you're you the mean. Only one who, like... in, in selfies, I come out as my real self. <laughs> yeah. But that's yeah. how you look to all of us. <laughs> is that how I look right now? Like just yeah. my avatar looks. With my face? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's oh, wow. So I, I opted for the cartoon because when I did my face, Spatial decided to give me like this horrible receding hairline. And I was like, uh, you know, I get it, but you don't need to emphasize it. So I, yeah. I went with the cartoon head. That's funny. Awesome. All right, guys. All righty. Well, awesome. well, I got a meeting to get to, guys. So I'm going cool. to send you guys uh, some of these selfies. Thanks again, everyone. Yep. Thanks thank again, you. Evan. Yeah, that thanks was for coming. Honestly, of it's course. such an amazing talk. Right. Well, thanks, Mo. I appreciate it. Yes. Thanks for helping coordinate everything, Juan. <laughs> thanks, Nicola. Of course, of course. <laughs> Have a good evening. See ya. Bye.